Hi class, this is Jerry Jankowski. I'm going to be talking about the typography, the history of Western typography. A note I could call it uh, Western because we are not discussing uh, other cultures, advanced cultures like China or India. Uh, we're using, uh, we are uh, isolating ourselves in the, uh, the Mediterranean uh, area, Europe, uh, because that's where the, we have the Latin alphabet. All right, so I would like to um, there we go. Sorry, trying to advance here. This is a wonderful, wonderful um, uh, YouTube video right here. Please watch this. I'm not going to play this all now. Uh, I don't need to show you a video in a video, but this is great if you just. Um, uh, paste it into your browser. Uh, this is what it is. This is the start of it. Type is power, power to express words. The idea is usually it's timeless, but type is power. The power to express words and ideas visually. It's timeless, but always changing. There we go. And that's awesome. what we're going to explore. All Most right. people agree that the creator... That's it right here. So uh, he is going to follow a lot of what I'm going to be talking about. So it's 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 a nice reinforcement. Uh, but he does it in such a beautiful, uh, fun, graphic way. I really encourage you to, to uh, look at this video. Okay, back to my PowerPoint. Next slide. So here we are, prior to the 1400s. Books were created in cultural centers like Egypt, Greece, Rome, and they were all handwritten. They were done one at a time, and they were quite expensive. The, the paper usually was animal skins, um, and um, in Egypt, I believe it would have been from papyrus parchments. But anyway, it was expensive. And anyway, the common people could not uh, read. Uh, this would be for people who were in government, uh, the priests, the nobility, that was about it. So in the Middle Ages in Europe, the centers of learning were in the monasteries, okay? Rome had kind of collapsed the Eastern and Western empires, so the centers were in the monasteries, okay? And the monks there created what we call now illuminated books or manuscripts. And here's an example of one. Uh, there's a book of Kells, very famous in uh, Ireland, and it's absolutely beautiful. If you ever visit there, please do get a chance to look at it. It is on display, or a copy of it is. I'm not quite sure if that was the original or not. But here's an example. And I just want to point out, this gave a lot of people work. Look at, uh, there's the writing. That was all hand done, okay? That was done with a, uh, a quill, ink and quill. Okay, so that's one person. One person did the border. See the little flowers and the vines? That's another person. And then we have some of these kind of funky illustrations. We got cattle on the bottom, somebody's plowing. I don't know what that thing is on the right. It really looks strange. But that would have been done by um, an illustrator. So we have three or four different specialists working on these. Okay. Then uh, 1800s, Gutenberg comes along, invents movable typefaces, and he gives the world a cheaper way to obtain the written word, okay? Paper was becoming less expensive at this time, and more people were learning how to read. That means there is a merchant class rising up. In other words, a middle class. Now, compared to today, that we're talking baby steps. It would have been a very small class, but a class that had money, okay? That is a driving, a driving force, okay? Commerce, money. Individual letters were cast in metal and arranged on a composer before they were locked into a chase to print, okay? Now, this is still going on. I mean, there's still examples of, of, of people doing this. There is a video on, on Canvas of uh, uh, some gentlemen still setting linotype, and I do encourage you to watch it. It's pretty interesting, very short, too. Notice on this composer, everything is upside down and it's backwards. That's how you had to arrange type. Okay, 
Here we go, Gutenberg. He's uh, creating the first type. It's called black letter. And black letter comes from some people uh, it, uh, in fonts. It's also called Old English. There are other variations of it. But uh, you'll notice it almost looks like it's been uh, handwritten with a quill. And that's because he used, he created this font. Um, and it was made to look like that because that was the only thing they had, the only font they had uh, to go from. So he continued it, okay? So this is uh, from uh, metal type. This is not handwritten. Now, what is handwritten, because this would have been very expensive to do in multicolor, the top three lines are in red. That would have been handwritten. Also, see that capital? That is done, um, that was done by an illustrator. Also, the Q on the right-hand middle side in that column, that also would have been left a little square open there uh, for that Q to be uh, illustrated or illuminated, okay? Here we go. Um, now, this kind of a font, some people call it, some people, it's, it's called, uh, I shouldn't say some people, it is an actual font that's called Old English. Uh, there are other different uh, names for it. There's, it's slightly different uh, styling. I believe one is called Fraktur. But it was popular in Germany until after World War II. It actually was a font that was the national font. Now, uh, that seems pretty amazing. Can you imagine the United States having a national font? I don't. Uh, uh, we just don't have that cultural background. But I believe Switzerland does also have one to this day, and it is Helvetica, where it was designed. Okay? Okay, jumping up to uh, 1470, Nicholas Jensen, big name in quote-unquote modern uh, typography. He created Roman type, and it was inspired by the text that you found, out, uh, that you found on uh, Roman buildings. If anybody has been to um, Italy, um, you'll see on the buildings, it's just, it's there. It's still there. It's incredible. But you notice they all have like little serifs. Notice it's all capital. There are no lowercase. And also there is no spaces in between words. I believe sometimes they might have put a dot. But other than that, there was no um, spaces. But anyway, it's, this is what it's something we're much more used to, even looking at it now. It looks quite modern compared to the black letter. All right. And then there's uh, Aldus Manutius. He created italics. He also designed some other fonts. Also a very important person in the development of, of typography. So here we go. Anybody who's really interested in typography, please investigate this. Look at this. Caslon is called Old Style. Then there comes Baskerville. It's a transitional font. And then there's Dido and uh, Bodoni. Okay? They're considered modern. Now, notice modern is 1780. We don't, today we use the modern incorrectly most of the time. Modern generally refers to a time period. We really should be speaking, when we say modern, we really should be seeing, saying contemporary. Okay? But you can see the slight differences. Uh, the Dido and the Bodoni, very much different. You can see how thick and thin the letters are. Okay? Now, Cas William Caslon, again, the fa uh, Caslon family uh, developed fonts and worked in the font business for generations. Okay? It was a family thing. And they, uh, William Caslon the fourth, took the serif font and serif fonts have those little things that stick out on, on the sides. And he made it, he snipped them off. And uh, it became a sans serif. Uh, at the time, people weren't quite sure what to make of it because they had never seen it before. But as advertising started increasing, as you start seeing these incredible posters being plastered on walls and, and newspapers advertising, there was much more need for dramatic fonts and also a better selection. So advertising, money is driving this. Okay, here we go. Where did uh, serifs come from, by the way? Okay, they were on the buildings. They still are. Here's the Pantheon in Rome. 
Um, I this is I stood in some front of this building. It's incredibly beautiful from 125 AD. Please, if you're ever there, go inside. It it you just it'll blow you away. Um, the theory or the belief was that the uh, the letter sculptors needed those serifs because as they were chiseling, they couldn't do a nice, neat, end with a nice, neat square. I don't know if that's true. These, these guys were pretty, pretty talented. Um, my point is I was looking at some uh, written graffiti in ancient Pompeii and look there below. Um, you can clearly see on the letters, there's serifs on them. Look at the M and the L's. They put serifs on them, and that's painting. So where serifs come from, nobody knows. Okay? Let's jump ahead. 1830s, 1900, the reign of Queen Victoria. This is an era they called the Victorian aesthetic. It was known for its extremely rich use of images. You got banners. You got these these really exotic fonts, what it basically is, it's adding layer upon layer upon layer of stuff. Usually most stuff is pretty centered too. Um, maybe I'm, I'm wrong a little bit here. Um, the one on the left isn't totally, the one in the middle is more centered and it's the one on the right. Um, it's what a lot of people call today busy. Busy means too much stuff. You know, you don't know when to stop. So it's uh, very well known. Victorian design is very well known for its lack of straight lines or edges. Everything just seems like it's moving all the time. This style was hated for a long time. Now you'll see later on in this, this discussion it's coming back in a form, in a modern form. Okay, Bauhaus and the Wiener Werkstatt uh, came along. We're talking now about 1919, 1933. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, Nazis closed the school. It moved to Chicago at the time as the new Bauhaus. Some of the members there were Laszlo Maholinaj, uh, Josef Albers, and Herbert Mbayer. Okay? Now, we're going from this, 1900, to this, 1919. quite a bit of a jump. A lot of people were absolutely scandalized by this. They hated it. <clears throat> they made fun of it. The uh, Bauhaus and the modernists that would come afterwards believe function should always dictate form. In this case, no decoration. If you were going to use decoration, minimal. Squares, rectangles, negative space. Looking on the bottom one by Jan Tischhold, uh, Die Neue uh, uh, typograf Typography. Top right, negative space. Top, uh, I mean bottom left, negative space. It's part of the design. Negative does not mean nothing. At least in this instance. Here we go. M more, more work. Okay. Uh, this is the international style, okay? It's developing. Uh, and and this, these are, I believe these are all Joseph Albers, Joseph Albers, okay? Uh, and here's a big guy in, in, as far as modernism is concerned, the Swiss designer, Max Medinger. He created Helvetica. And it says here, the most loved typeface of our time. I didn't write that. I picked it up. I don't know if it's love. Some people hate it because it's uh, so overused. But keep in mind Helvetica is an incredibly well-designed font that is neutral. It doesn't evoke anything from you. It doesn't make you happy, sad, exuberant. It doesn't do anything. You have to do something to it if you want it to be expressive. Okay? Remember that about Helvetica. It's a good font to start off with when you're designing. Um, and when I went to grad school at the University of Illinois, Chicago, all my instructors were from Switzerland. So Helvetica 
was the only font we were allowed to use for two years. Okay? And you had to make it uh, be expressive when it needed to be. Here are some more. Now, the international style is still the go-to style used in business today. It's clean, it communicates directly, and it is based on an organized grid system. And we'll talk about grids later on. However, there are many styles since then that have come and gone. Uh, with internet, with the computer, things have are starting changing very fast. Styles have risen in protest of the international styles, attempt at orderliness and control. Okay? In the 1980s, new wave, punk, postmodernism were everywhere tied to uh, fashion and music. Okay? Um, remember that typography graphic design is very closely connected with what's going on in other areas. Okay? Music, it's a part of it too. You can even look at uh, contemporary music. Um, you know, the type of uh, album covers that they have. I don't know, they still call them album covers. Um, but what you see on your iPhone, okay? So, uh, still some great work being done. All right. David Carson. When I was uh, uh, in the 90s, he was this hero. He was, I hated modernism. I just felt so confined um, by it. I had to go to school, back to school, to really understand Helvetica and modernism and, and learn to like it again and learn to know when is it, uh, it's, a, a, it's good to use and when it's an easy solution when you're stuck. We definitely will talk about that. Okay, so um, David Carson did the magazine Raygun. And you can see what he's doing. He's letter, layering type. He's putting images. He's doing huge type. This is, shows the computer coming in. Doing this with letterpress would be very difficult. Okay? And uh, this new design aesthetic, he called the new chaos. So type, text and type, uh, were part of the image. They were part of the vibe. So a lot of what he wrote, I used to pick up Raygun all the time. Some of it you couldn't read, um, and you weren't meant to. Okay? So what are, we, what are we doing today? What I want you in this class is to always look around. Look around. Because typography is everywhere, we take advantage of it. We don't see it anymore. We don't really look at it. Please look at it. Look at bus stops. Look at websites, magazines, packaging design. There are stores like Muji in uh, Los Angeles and Ikea. Uh, Muji obviously is Japanese, Ikea is Scandinavian. I think it's uh, uh, Sweden. The blue, and, the blue and yellow, I believe, are the, the Swedish flag. Um, so we are now into another period beyond uh, modernism that's being called new minimalism. Minimal, minimal meaning little, less, less is more, much less is more. Look at the ad on the right hand side for sleep. You can't get too much more minimal than that. Okay? The font, Helvetica. Okay? Another style. Whenever there's a style, there always tends to be a contrary style. It's the yin and yang of things. East and west, up and down, we got minimalism. Now there's also a style called heritage. It's very popular with food products, with uh, alcohol products, and it's really fun. It's a fun style which borrows a lot from the Victorian era but takes it further. It's got a contemporary sensibility. All right. Look at this. This is not Victorian. The whiskey gentry on the right-hand side, the higher choir, it, it, their, the, their copy, everything about this is meant to be playful. Look at the rooster. He's got tattoos on him, and he's, he's drinking whiskey. On the right, we have Lucky Brand, Los Angeles. Poor Wolf got arrows in him. Uh, California quality goods. Um, 
And notice it's got this old look to it. Everything seems to be kind of worn down. There's a look to that, and we'll discuss that later, too, in our class. All right? This is the last slide, class. Tomorrow. What, what is going to be happening tomorrow? Nobody knows. But whatever it is, um, whatever the style of typography that trends next year or the year after, try to use the fonts with sensitivity, good intent, and appropriateness. Don't just do them as a gimmick, please. You will never, ever be a good designer or a typographer if you do. I'm not saying don't be expressive. Do be expressive. But please just be a good designer. First, be a good designer. Explore. Be expressive, too. Thank you.